Before we plunge into the ocean of Bach again, I'm going to give you the drip-dry version of my life with Bach. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a Bach expert by any means. I'm just someone who, who loves Bach very much and has always studied and played Bach. And I think that everyone has his own way with it, you know, and that's what it should be. Um, I was um, first introduced to Bach by uh, an ancient uh, 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 German cellist who happened to be uh, um, a, a, a customer in my father's store. And when he announced that he was a musician, he played the cello, my father immediately started boasting about his son, who was a pianist. I wasn't by any means a pianist by this time. <laughs> and. Um, so the old man was very interested, and he said, well, I'd like to hear you play sometime. So I was brought to him, and he turned out to be, you know, as, as the sort of thing that little boys always notice. He had a large stomach and lots of whiskers, <laughs> and he seemed terribly old. <laughs> but he was very sweet and very nice, and I, I really began to like him very much when he, after he had heard me play and said, you need some Bach. And so he gave me the Bach two-part inventions. I fell madly in love with them. And I worked hard at them. And after a year, I could play all of them. And I, I bless him and thankful to him for the rest of my life because he was the beginning. Well, eventually, I <clears throat> we were not living in Seattle at the time. We were living in Everett. And we moved to Seattle, and I got into the hands of a prominent teacher here who uh, set about making, trying to make a virtuoso of me. So for a while, uh, poor Bach was forgotten, uh, at least to a, to a good degree. I managed to, now and then to learn something. I learned the Italian concerto. I learned uh, a couple of brothers and fugues. And uh, almost on the QT, I love to play Bach. And, uh, but you know, with the problem of really trying to build a virtuoso technique, I was given all sorts of difficult music. And, and that, that took all my time. But I did manage to learn the um, Chromatic Fantasy and Fugue, which is uh, really one of Bach's major keyboard works. And about when the time uh, I, I arrived uh, at the age of 18, having graduated from high school, I began to feel that I, I needed something different from what I was getting. And um, I, I, for a while, I just, uh, I, I earned a little money by doing some teaching I went on practicing and hoping against hope that something would come up for me, that I would get a scholarship or something would happen. Well, behold, it did happen. A friend of mine in Victoria, BC, was a, um, what you call a, um, a she was a, a now impresario. She, she loved to uh, manage visiting musicians. And she had read in the newspaper about some of my performances down here. My teacher had me playing all over the place. And it went, you know, it was advertised in the papers. So she read about it. She wrote to my uh, teacher and said, what about this Hokanson boy? Is he any, he any good? And if he is, could we have him up here for a concert? <laughs> and of course, my teacher wrote back to me and he said, of course, he's wonderful. And you certainly may have him for a concert. So that was the beginning. So I, my first concert there, up there was in the um, Empress Hotel Ballroom. And I went up there every, every year after that to give a concert. Well, this dear lady who was the impresario um, was very interested in my career. And she sensed that I felt that I needed something really big, you know. And she happened to be a very good friend of Harold Sandburg an English pianist who had, some years before, made a great reputation as a Bach pianist. He had given a whole week of Bach, and it was, 
At the beginning, nobody knew anything about him, but he got wonderful reviews, and by the end, you couldn't get tickets. He was a success overnight. But he was already 40 when this happened. He had had to earn his living by teaching and accompanying. And uh, that made him a great musician in the process, and so he was all ready to go when he had that set. Well, he came out to Victoria to do the annual festival there, to adjudicate and to give some concert. And my, my dear friend thought, this is my chance to have Hokanson play for him. So I played for him, and guess what I played? The Chromatic Fantasy. That was, that was real temerity, to play <laughs> that tremendous composition for a great Bach player. So, um, at the end, he was silent for a while, and then he said, where did you learn to play Bach? And my first reaction was, oh dear, he doesn't like it. He wonders how I could play it that way and why. <coughs> and then he uh, immediately started, he said, you know, I like it very much. He said, it isn't all it should be or all it can be, but he said, you are on the right track, I think. And he said, I'd like to work with you. And of course, I said, well, I would like it too, but there's no way. And uh, my dear friend, uh, who was known by all the wealthy people in Victoria, immediately got on the, on the wire to everybody. And uh, since I was known in Victoria by now, having done all those concerts, um, she got money for me to go abroad because he was going to give me a scholarship if I could get abroad. And that's the way it happened. So I was there for three years. But the sad part was that I had only a few months with him because the poor man, on return from a concert, uh, uh, concert engagement, was stricken with um, thrombosis, uh, uh, coronary thrombosis, and he did not survive. Only a few weeks. So I was, I was really bereft. Uh, but um, I continued to work with a pupil of his, who happened to be a very prominent musician and composer in, uh, in London. And until Myra Hiss returned from her, uh, her uh, annual tour in the United States, she returned and said uh, that Harold Samuel had talked to her about me and she wanted to hear me play. So I prepared and went to play for her and she accepted me as a student. So I worked with her for the rest of the time for those three years that I was in London. And um, I, I worked on Bach with her, but um, not so much that as, as other things. She, she saw that I was ready to, you know, plunged in, into, a, into a career with, you know, all kinds of music. So we had no specialization at Bach. But, uh, so that is briefly my tale about my Bach experience. But of course, all through my years of teaching, I gave my students tons of Bach, partly so I could learn it. <laughs> and um, so I, I became acquainted with a, a great deal of it. Um, <clears throat> but I, uh, I decided now, in my old age, that Bach is what I want to live with for the rest of my time, because it is the greatest music that there is for us. And it is the most satisfying and the most demanding at the same time. Now, when you're my age, you know, arthritis and that kind of thing takes hold. And it's difficult to cope with really a virtual soul stuff. I don't try to do that anymore, but Bach, is well within the scope of somebody who can still play very fluently, but doesn't have that extra, you know, that extra virtuosic punch, that extra amount of technique that it takes to, you know, to be a, a, a touring concert artist. Uh, I had plenty of experience uh, 
uh, uh, touring and playing in public, and uh, I had no small success. But uh, unfortunately, I didn't get rave reviews for my New York first New York recital. So my management said, "Well, not much we can do for you without that, you know." So finally, that wore out. So I went into teaching. When the University of Washington offered me a professorship, I gladly accepted because I, by that time I had decided that my life was to be in teaching because I, I thought that would be more genuinely satisfying in the end and it would give me a chance at the same time to do lots of concert work. As I, did, I played a lot of concerts while I was at the university. I must have done at least 100 solo concerts there during those 35 years of teaching. So I learned a lot too, again, teaching. That's the marvelous thing about teaching. You learn so much with, along with your students. So enough of me now. Um, we're starting tonight with Prelude and Fugue number 18 in G sharp minor. <clears throat> oh, thank you. She's reminding me to take my hearing aid out. I can't play with it in. It sounds dreadful. It sounds it's just so harsh and terrible. I can't stand it. Thank you. Now, this piece, G sharp minor, uh, has a, a curiously little. Um, sort of melancholy tinge to it, although rhythmically you wouldn't suppose so, but it's there. Uh, mostly the fugue, I mean, what is, the, 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 the prelude is a three-part invention, actually, with its usual inversions, and um, uh, the fugue is a four-voice four fugue, if this is the this is the subject. It says to me, "Oh dear, I'm not right. Oh, I wish I knew what was wrong with me." I do not believe that that long first note is meant to be connected with. It's very untypical of Bach to start with a long note and then go on with some shorter notes in his subjects. He usually starts with shorter notes or else with a series of long notes, not a single one. So I decided what this is, is uh, it's a deep sigh at the beginning and then another one. And then a real big one.
notice that it ends with the two notes with which it began. So that is sort of corroborated by feeling about separating that from the rest of the phrase. The next credit of the cue. Did somebody ask a question? Yeah, are you going to do the, the prelude? Or are you going to do this? I did, I did the prelude to this one. No, no. Yes, darling, I played the I played the prelude. <laughs> of course I did. I certainly played it. Didn't I? No. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's not possible. <laughs> you played it in practice. Why well, did what? You played it while you were practicing. Oh. Well, shall I play it now? Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, this is the B part of the intro. <laughs> six uh, permutations of this. Now you know that's a fancy word to, to describe how you put uh, the three voices in different positions. There are six possible positions, and out of that he uses four, where all of them are present. And when I speak about triple counterpoint, uh, and this is all written in triple counterpoint, that means it's invertible counterpoint, that is so devised that 
uh, all of the voices sound equally well harmonically in no matter what position they are. <clears throat> I must tell you a little bit story about the, about the fugue because it's very silly and I, I, I really ought to be kind of ashamed to admit it, but I think of this as a, a group of cherubs tumbling. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. But what happened was I was practicing it one day and I happened to look over at my mantle and saw a, a little ceramic group of uh, little putties, you know, the little Italian angels that you see uh, in the paintings, the ceiling paintings of, of the Venetian artists. And uh, they are always very fat and chubby and they have little wings sprouting from their buttocks. And they're, they're very cute. And so in, in Italy, you buy these little figurines, you see, show, showing them in various things. And two of them are, one is halfway uh, on its way, just uh, standing on its head. The other one is already standing on its head. And the other one has already tumbled. And uh, th I thought, well, hey, there are three of them, and there are three voices here. And the subject sounds exactly like one of them say, on your mark, get ready, and go. And then falling. And that, it really, uh, uh, it really makes sense what you think when you hear it. Anyway, uh, not so uh, frivolous with the, with the prayer. Three voice, uh, a triple few.
it uses the subject, uh, the little first little tumbler, it gets a new, uh, a new uh, counter subject in that. And then, and then when that's all finished, he has a complete exposition. Uh, he, well, by the way, he changes the intervals. The, the intervals of the uh, subject are a, a rising fourth and a falling fifth. Well, he changes that with this do sound sound after and introducing it in the original form, and then he changes the intervals to to rising sixth. Okay, so instead of doing tale to tell about this next uh, prelude and fugue in A minor. Um, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I shouldn't say that because uh, I admire it in a way, but I really don't like it. I don't think it's a successful performing piece. And I think the reason probably lies here that when Bach was assembling things that he had already written and writing new pieces for this, uh, this great work, uh, the 48 Thousand Fugues, he was, uh, he was getting ready the first volume while he was uh, employed at Anstad, uh, I, I mean at, at Curtin, uh, where the prince himself was a, a performer. He played the, uh, the gamba, and he, the flute, and the violin. And he loved to play himself, so he he made he asked Bach to write a lot of chamber music, which Bach did, uh, as well as working at uh, solo things for the cembalo. And um, I feel that he chose things from different periods. He chose a lot of his early things, and he chose things that he wanted to improve on, and so on. And I dearly wish that he had decided not to include this because it's long and it's boring. <laughs> and, and, and I think the reason is he does so many things uh, with the, his contrapuntal technique, which was so wonderful. There are at least 17 uh, strettos in it, 17, imagine that. And the problem with it is that I think uh, it's lack of variety stems from the fact that the counter subject is too much like the subject. So there's no real contrast. So I'll show you what the subject is. Has given us the small note in, in bed to show. 
show that that wasn't written out in the score, but that's what happened when he used that 16-foot pedal, you see. So it goes like this. <laughs> that he wrote for the harpsichord. It's a, a sort of an exploratory, getting, uh, going through different keys with different uh, uh, kinds of, uh, you know, arpeggios and scales and figures, um, exploring those, uh, those keys. So he starts out in B flat, and then he goes through a number of keys, and then in the middle there is a dramatic interruption with some forte chords and more cadenzas, and finally a sort of a recitativo succession that uh, uh, ends the piece. <laughs>
Now we come to one of the greatest of all the 48 prayers and fugues, the B flat minor in book one. Uh, every time I come to approach this prelude, I feel that I should get down on my knees. It is so beautiful, it is so moving, but it is so difficult, you know. Um, it really should, is, it really should be played by an organist, and so, because it, it, it has to be so legato, and because it's written in chordal successions uh, with the melody, it's very difficult to keep the legato. You know, it, it takes a lot of work to really achieve that. And this is the moment, moment to say that I think I should have mentioned earlier that in his fugal writing, Bach, Bach often writes in uh, rather lengthy harmonic periods where uh, his material is exposed and he finally comes to a cadence of some sort, which is obviously a breathing place, and then he starts again, and then it will go on to a, through another period and into another cadence in a different key, and so on. And of course, there are different numbers of periods according to what he is writing. This uh, prelude falls into just such periods. Uh, the, 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 uh, the first period starts in B flat minor and keeps very much to that and in its dominant and finally cadences and then starts a new, uh, uh, a new uh, period which modulates and brings him to, to another and eventually the, to the key of F minor, which is the dominant. He stays in that for a while and then comes to a cadence, full cadence, which time you get a little dialogue between elements that you've heard in the beginning. And then it works into a wonderful climax, which ends on the dominant. And then from that point on to the end is the final period, working itself back to the tonic again. So if you bear that in mind, and that is a good index for the performer, too, to realize that he should feel it in these large scale uh, units and do uh, uh, arrange his, his uh, dynamics so that you feel you reach a climax in that and then drop back and go again and reach another climax.
five voice fugue. Quality 
between the two things, the preterite and the fugue. And the, the relationship uh, between a prelude and a fugue is not always so clear. And sometimes there is not really any relationship at all, uh, much as people talk about it. But uh, yeah, this, this one is clear that there is a relationship. <laughs> Out to be 
appoggiaturas. See, that covers all 12 tones in different uh, intervals. But he rises a whole sixth to get the first of those, and then it drops a fourth, and then rises another sixth. Uh, so it has a certain symmetry, and ends with the first three notes in, in the dominant key. You see, it starts that way and ends that way with the appoggiatures in between. Now the appoggiatures are going to offer some difficulty as far as harmony is concerned at counterpoint. And uh, you will notice probably uh, more dissonant passages in this fugue than you have heretofore. I want to show you a few things about that. Uh, when you come to um, one, two, three, four, the end of the fourth measure, you have um, and by the way, the answer to that subject is, has altered uh, intervals. It starts this way, but the answer does this. Why? Because it is a, what they call a tonal fugue, and the answer has to contrive to get you back to the original key after it has, the answer has finished. And, uh, and so, uh, in order to do that, if you kept the same intervals that the subject announced, you would end up in the wrong key. You'd end up in uh, a key above where you should be. And so, uh, you have that. The, the, the scheme is the same, the shape is the same but the intervals are slightly different. That's always so with a tonal view. There has to be some alteration in the answer in order to conform to the necessities of the, of the key. Um, I was going to show you what happens with the appoggiatures. Now, that, the last note uh, of bar four starts on F sharp, and it, it does the first five notes of, of, the, of the scale. And against that, you have the appoggiaturas. Now you can hear that uh, each time there is an, uh, a, a resolution. That's dissonant. That's a ninth, you see. Re resolves to a tenth. This is a fifth, which is not considered dis dissonance, but in this instance, in the context, it is a dissonance. Resolves on G sharp to make a sixth. The next one is a sixth also, but resolves. This time it doesn't resolve, it makes a seventh. And then the next note is again a ninth, resolving. And then we have a third, resolving to a fourth, and going finally to a, a, an augmented a fourth, and then we have that little finishing, and we're back in the key. So I'm going to play that far uh, again for you.
Now, I want to show you how on the strong beats of this next bar, you get quite dissonant things. These are all the dissonant chords that happens on the first beat, but they're all resolved, as you will hear. when he puts a different counterpoint with the subject. Uh, and this entry in the bass, uh, in the middle voice. I guess that he puts in the bass. but sometimes with one or two uh, other counterpoints. It's a four-voice view. Uh, between those entries, you have a wonderful, uh, what we call an episode, a connecting link between uh, different entries. And uh, this uh, um, has a very soothing effect because it's very diatonic. There's very little chromaticism in it. And it's in an easily understood flowing sequence, you see. And he, uh, he brings this in as a relief against those more dissonant entries of the subject. All right, without further ado. Well, I do want to say something more. That, um, they are, uh, as a development, he uses that little figure that I showed you at the end. He uses that to develop quite a bit. I won't say anything more about it because I don't want to confuse you. 
Well, the prelude, uh, the prelude is um, unusual. It's a, a binary sonata form, which means that it's in two more or less equal parts. And then the second half more or less reflects what happens in the first half, develops it somewhat. And there's usually some kind of recapitulation. What it is actually is a duet between the middle voice and the soprano, accompanied by uh, a marching bass. <laughs> character in itself, and in the treble you get, in the middle voice starts it. Piano, piano, I mean, the soprano immediately comes in and imitates it.
difficult to listen to, too, until you really know it. Uh, now, I'm going to play for you uh, my very favorite of the whole of the 48, the wonderful E major from book two, number nine. You don't have book two with you, do you? Too bad. <laughs> won't notice any mistakes. <laughs> this, uh, the prelude is, it's again a uh, binary sonata form. Um, <clears throat> You will hear that uh, at the beginning of the second half uh, in the dominant key. You have um, the same thing that you have in the open, but very quickly in the second bar, it shifts to another key. And then it's developed further, and there's a sort of a recapitulation in the last uh, third, I think that's what I would say. Uh, <clears throat> it's in three voices. <clears throat> the fugue uh, is a four-voice fugue, and it's a stretto fugue, but it's almost pointless to speak about stretto with this piece because it's so wonderful. It's, it, 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 you don't notice it because it's so woven into the wonderful texture of the piece. This is the fugue which uh, Donald Francis Tovey, one of the great critics of the 20th century, said was as close as Bach ever came to the great polyphony of the Renaissance. Because it's very, it's not a um, florid a fugue at all. Almost every note in it is important to the structure. Very little actual decoration. 